Uh, welcome everybody to um, first of the Upstart Play is the Way groups. And we've got a couple of quite amazing speakers today. Well, we're very, very fortunate, two really distinguished ladies tonight. Um, the first speaker is Suzanne Zedag, who actually needs no introduction if you live in Scotland. Um, she's um, a developmental psychologist, it says at the back of the Play is the Way, and She's um, interested in the science of human connection, particularly, which led to the formation of, of um, the Connected Baby organisation. I think she's probably best known in Scotland because she's also one of the founders and leading lights of the Ace Aware Nation movement, which has made huge waves over the last three, three years. Um, and she, we asked to write our first chapter for the book Play, Play is the Way because we wanted to start on attachment. And Suzanne, of course, is out the, the big Scottish attachment um, expert. And I asked her, can you show the links please between love and play and how they work together? So she did that admirably, quite brilliantly, but also managed to cover the whole of Scottish culture, you know, just to sort of cut the chapter out of it. Um, so, um, Suzanne, if I ask, can I pass over to you now? Would you do your screen share? Can I just say I'm stopping and you're starting? Sue, so it's lovely to be here and I'm laughing because I'm thinking, oh, I don't have the word attachment or love or play in my presentation tonight <laughs> at all. I just wanted to say how delightful it is to be part of this conversation and to think about where we all take this conversation, both in Scotland, but well beyond our borders. And I know that a number of you have come from beyond those borders tonight. And so I, I hope that what we're talking about in Scotland will help others to feel brave because I think there are some really exciting things that we're doing and they give me hope in a time that sometimes is worrying both in terms of COVID and in terms of why sometimes it is hard for us to really get our heads around the importance of play. So, well, the word play is in my slides tonight because that was in my title. So when I went to think about what would I talk about tonight, I thought, okay, I'll start with the title of my chapter, which was Relationships, Play, and learning in Scottish identity. But guys, I actually think that's a boring title. So a much more interesting title for tonight is COVID as an opportunity. Because I do think we have lots of opportunities coming our way because of the deep thinking that we are having to do. But I also might have called tonight, why is doing smart things for children so hard for our society? Why do we need upstart? I would like to live in a world where there is no need for upstart because the argument for a kindergarten stage is obvious. So one of the, the questions that was under my, underneath in my head tonight is why is this hard for us? Okay, so if I start with one of the big rows that we're having at the moment, it's that word catch up. There has been a tremendous amount of angst on social media about the fact that that word catch up is being used in the media and by leading educational thinkers and by politicians, not just in Scotland, of course, but in England, but it's in both places. Okay, that language of catch up had us so wound up <laughs> that Kate tweeted a few days ago had anyone heard Keir Bloomer talking about catch up on the radio? And Sue tweeted back, nope, just as well. I might have had a seizure. In other words, there's strong feeling about that language of catch up. Now, not everybody is using that language. So here's the Guardian's piece from a couple of days ago. Helping children recover education is not enough, that we need to think much more broadly than just education or indeed catch up. The word well-being is increasingly being used 
by some folks. And indeed, I just wanted to comment for anybody who missed it that um, in terms of the word well being, the new uh, well being campaign for We Ones launched today from Parent Club on the Scottish Government website. And so there's a real focus on well being and, um, and emotional and social experiences for babies being talked about in the ether at the moment. And the other big news from this week is that the Scottish Greens have put their money on the table and called for a kindergarten stage for children to start school at seven officially and made a part of their platform. All of that is celebratory. And some people are thinking even much more widely than that. Here's another piece where there is a call to reconsider the whole of the welfare state. So there is a lot of hope about and some big thinking. And yet, I think we struggle very often to do smart things for children. And I find myself wondering, why is that? Asking with genuine curiosity, why is that so often a struggle for us? And that's the question I tackled in my book or in my chapter in the book. <clears throat> so there's that boring title, Relationships Play and Learning in Scottish Identity. But I set off from this place. This is, these are Sue's words. She said in the foreword that in 2015, Upstart had had high hopes that they could achieve a kindergarten stage fairly easily. But they soon recognized that there was a potential barrier which was the deeply ingrained cultural acceptance in Scotland that instruction in the three R's should begin at the age of four or five. And I asked in my chapter, maybe that's not the way to see it. What if culture isn't the barrier? What if culture is the point? Maybe Upstart's potential is not just in securing educational change, but it's actually in helping to shift Scotland's sense of itself, which is an even bigger vision than a kindergarten stage. And that may sound a bit grand, but here's why I said it. I think that Scotland's sense of itself, that identity is one of the key reasons that Upstart has found it difficult to make the headway that was predicted. And I think that the vision for play-based learning up to the age of seven challenges some of our, more than our educational structure. I think maybe it challenges Scotland's sense of itself. When you're proud of your cultural heritage, then seeing the kind of shift that Upstart has been asking for is a is this shift of identity, not just a shift in a vision for education. Okay, so to think more deeply about that, I went back in time. And often trying to understand more about your origins is a good way to answer those questions. Why is it hard for us to do this? So in the 1700s, education was offered by the church. And the church was proud of what it offered. So it offered education of the masses to rich and poor, to boys and girls, beginning early at the age of five. And of course, part of the point of that was so that you could read the Bible. But here's a crucial insight. Then in 1872, when the Education Act came along, a lot of what happened was that they just picked up what was standard for the way the education was done by the church. So there's a, there's a shift that, happens and a shift that doesn't happen. In 1872, some of the conversations that might have been held about how would we do education didn't happen because you transfer what seems normal. Now, Sue has suggested that that means that Scotland is trapped by its history and tradition. But here's an interesting way to think about it. If you have a history that you're proud of, then it it doesn't feel like you're trapped. It feels like you're proud of it and that you want to retain it. So a question becomes, is that history 
something that we're really proud of. Who are we? What do we stand for? What does our culture think about these kinds of questions? I think we are really having questions around cultural identity when we talk about some of the visions that Upstart has. Now, so then if you ask, okay, so what are elements of Scottish identity? Well, frivolity and play are not part of traditionally how Scots see themselves or part of Scottish identity. And so when you talk about play, lots of people think that you're talking about frivolity. So if you want to help people to feel good about play, then I think that's part of how we have come to attach learning so much to the agenda of play. That phrase, learning through play, we use it a lot because that validates play. If you talk about play and, and education, look in the media, the media uses stories, pictures all the time that are of a real traditional classroom. And if you think about the Play Talk Read bus, it's the Play Talk Read bus. It's not the Play Talk Laughter bus or the Play 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 bus. The reading helps to legitimate the play, I think. I think these are questions around identity. Who are we? Who do we want to be? What's our vision for ourselves and for our children? Now, with those questions behind us, there are tons of things happening in the country that speak to that question about who are we? So there's realizing the ambition, the early years practice guidance, there's the care review, there's uh, the give them time campaign, which is trying to help us to think about deferring children. There's Play Scotland, and there's the year of childhood, which we're gonna hear about more after me. But look at those bottom two. They have Scottish, in fact, the Scottish government, is, they have Scottish symbols on them. I think these speak to who are we as a culture? Who do we want to be and who could we be? And who decides that? Okay, so let's shift to thinking about culture change for a moment because I think that is what we are engaged in is culture change. And there are so many things happening across the country that feed into that discussion. Culture change takes conversation. In fact, it takes curious conversation. So let me give an example by what I mean and how I think we do this. It happened for me today on Twitter about the Scottish Greens call for a kindergarten stage. Somebody named Mixer Tay had tweeted a few days ago in response to the Scottish Greens announcement of this commitment that they were against this idea. And when I read it, I thought poor Sue's heart will clutch at the idea that someone has said, I'm against this to the Scottish Greens. And Sue, I can see that you're smiling. I'm glad about that. So Mixer Tay has said, as a kid, I'd have preferred learning more sooner, not later. So here's curiosity. I just chipped in my two cents worth and said, hi, I'm following this announcement. Could I genuinely ask, what do you fear will be lost by a kindergarten stage? What if the solution, if it was the solution to meeting the individual needs of more children? Now I'm talking to somebody on Twitter that I've never met, I have no idea who they are. Twitter is full of people who are angry at each other. So Mixer Tay might not have spoken to me or might've been suspicious about my intentions. So I've tried to signal to Mixer Tay by saying thank you and by using the word genuine that I would really like to have a conversation about something that they're opposed to. And they came back. In the course of the conversation, they said, I don't like this idea because I think the academics will be delayed. Since it was stated that kindergarten would start at four or five and school would start at seven. And like I said, I wanted those things earlier. And if I did, I'm sure others will too. If I get curious about what Mixer Tay's worries are and repeat back what I think they've just told me. So I said, okay, so you think school equals reading a math and kindergarten equals not reading a math. The important stuff and the not important stuff. If you were assured that kindergarten and play also included 
reading and math and didn't sacrifice or delay them, would you feel more comfortable with that? And Mixer Tay came back and said, yep. If I was reassured that kindergarten would encourage kids to learn as much as they are able about the world alongside play, then I'd be more comfortable with the idea. There's the idea. Play is something separate than learning. I think we need to have these kinds of conversations so that we understand, so that we understand more about what each other think. And if we can have those curious conversations, that's what will drive culture change. And I want to end by just reminding us, we've done this in lots of ways before in Scotland. So here's um, Carol Craig's book. Carol Craig's book is part of the, of the series in which Play is the Way is published. Carol Craig asked in this book why, why we have struggled in some ways to nurture our children in Scotland in the past? And how have we achieved some of the changes that we're seeing now? Here's an image of that big ACES conference that Sue has already said that I and others were part of. There's 2000 people in a room. I know now that looks shocking and it's hard to remember that ever you could sit that close to someone. But in September, 2018, 2000 people gathered in that room to talk about childhood trauma and childhood suffering. People want to have conversations about uncomfortable topics. And can I remind us that if we go back to 2005, even the police were doing that. This is John Carnican. He is a friend of Upstarts. And indeed, he had also a book in the postcard series. And I end my chapter by quoting from John about play. But tonight I wanted to end by quoting from him about culture change. Because in his book, he said this about how the police made change to violence and gang membership. He said, I never consciously thought about why there was so much violence. I just presumed that's what it was like and that it was my job to deal with it. In other words, it was curiosity that helped John Carnican, Karen McCluskey and his colleagues to think differently about something as scary as violence. So I think that COVID, which has introduced us to a lot of scary ideas and made us face up to things like the inequality that is across the country. I think if we can do that in relation to violence and we have done that before in Scotland, I think all of the conversations that are happening at the moment means that COVID is an opportunity for curiosity. And I feel really hopeful about what is possible because of that. And I have been delighted to speak about that tonight. Thank you, Sue and Kate. Thank you, Suzanne, very much indeed. I like hopefulness and optimism at the moment. It's, it's, it's very good for one. And we, we have our second speaker, I think, can also be optimistic because um, Kathy, who wrote chapter four, um, Kathy McCulloch, was one of the founders 25 years ago of the Children's Parliament, which is, um, is a, an institution, it is now a Scottish institution, which was devoted to helping to get the idea of children's rights out through the children themselves. Um, it's been immensely successful over the last 25 years. And as a sort of present, a birthday present for 25 years, this year we are due as, um, as, a, as a nation to um, incorporate the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child into Scots law. And there's only a handful of countries have actually done that around the world. So um, Kathy has also, another distinguishing mark of Kathy is that she managed to persuade the Scottish government to call this the year of childhood, which again is a hugely optimistic and hopeful thought and so many opportunities there. So, Cathy, can I hand over to you now to just give a, a, your presentation about, um, about chapter four? Thank you, Sue, for that. And thank you to Suzanne, that was wonderful. And 
chimes entirely with what I would like to talk about, this issue about cultural identity and why doing things for children is so hard in our society. And um, I want to start by inviting all of you to join me in celebrating, because in a world of uncertainty, what is certain? What do we know? Well, we know that stopping problems from starting in the first place is a good thing to do. And we know that childhood is the most important time in our lives. So the reason for celebrating is that the Scottish Government is incorporating the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child into Scots law this year. The most important piece of legislation to come before the Scottish Parliament and the very best, most amazing thing to happen for children across Scotland ever. I promise you. Now, for some of you, you'll be on this journey. For some of you, it will be quite new. And for some of you, you might even feel a bit hostile towards it. Children's rights, that's all we need. Children have got far too many rights as it is, is, is something that we hear a lot. But if someone told you that there was something that would help to keep children safe, healthier, happier, would you support it? Of course you would. I know you would. And Sue reminded me of this wonderful quote by Archbishop Desmond Tutu recently. We need to stop pulling bodies out of the river and start looking upstream to where they're falling in. And where we are in Scotland, I think, is that we have big problems. We have big problems and we think we need targeted solutions. And sometimes we do. But only looking at targeted solutions leads us to initiativeitis and not systemic and cultural change. Now, there are wonderful initiatives in Scotland um, and there are initiatives for everything from poverty to trauma to obesity to you know, you name it, there's an initiative for it. And we will always need initiatives. They're really important because there will always be children and families who need additional support. But unless we do something different, we're, the definition of insanity means that we're going to do the same thing over and over again. So embedding, embedding the UNCRC means working upstream. It means working upstream across sectors. Children don't live their lives in silos and we can't work in silos in order to resolve some of these issues. And it means locating everything that we do in prevention. So for anybody that worries that UN conventions and treaties sounds really techy and legalistic and not really my thing, please be reassured that it is your thing. It's every single one of ours thing. And let's just read a little bit from the preamble if you need to be convinced here it says, it recognises that the child, for the full and harmonious development of his or her personality, should grow up in a family environment, in an atmosphere of happiness, love and understanding. This is international legislation. Love is there at the heart of the UNCRC. And there are four key general principles there that you see in the bottom left. Best interests of a child, children's participation, survival and development and non-discrimination. That's it. And we do that by doing the three P's. We provide services, we protect children, and we make sure that children participate as active agents in their own lives. Until adults, until we understand the power of children's human rights, children will, be, will continue to, do, to be dependent on individual adults choosing to be kind and respectful. We can choose. We can choose to respect a child's human dignity today or not. And until children have knowledge, understanding and experience of their rights, adults hold all the power. So if a child doesn't know that it's not okay for an adult to hit them, to abuse them, to humiliate them, why would they tell somebody that these things are happening to them? They expect it. Upstart is clearly concerned with education. So let's quickly look at education. The three main articles uh, in the UNCRC Article 28, education must respect children's dignity. 29, education must develop every child's personality, talents and abilities to the full. And Article 31, which you know, relax, play and take part in a wide range of cultural and artistic activities. Doesn't talk about maths and science and reading and literature, doesn't talk about that. It talks about a child's full, the personality, talents and abilities to the full. So if it's so amazing, and I promise you it is amazing, what stops it being embedded? Well, lack of awareness, knowledge and understanding. 
the status of children alongside Scotland's cultural environment. I would argue, and in fact, I was looking at Alan, Miller, um, Alan Sinclair's cha chapter yesterday, and he talks too about, we tolerate children in Scotland. We don't see them as equal citizens. You know, a four-year-old is equal, an equal citizen to me, but how often have you heard people talk about children as citizens of the future? Well, what does that make them now then? Alongside our myths and understandings, children's rights means children get to do what they want. No, it doesn't. Children's rights means adults lose authority over children. No, it doesn't. If you're the kind of family that says, no, you can't have your ice cream till you've finished your peas, that's entirely up to you. Nobody's going to stop you from doing that. Adults don't choose to have human rights. They have them through the very fact that they're human. And adults can't choose to give children their human rights. They have them through the fact that they're human. So we did this, um, Sue was at a session that we did the other day and um, we used this example, it was with the colleagues from Together, Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights and Education Scotland and we gave them this scenario and we said imagine if we ran businesses the way schools are run. So for example when you arrive at work in the morning you've got to stand outside whatever the weather and you have to line up to get in. I'll just choose some of these. When you receive your brief for the day you've got to sit on the floor while your line manager sits on a chair. You only have your breaks and lunch at a certain time when a bell rings and if you don't go to the toilet in those times then you need to ask permission in front of all your colleagues and explain why you didn't go in your break and if your line manager isn't happy with your performance would would you have your name written up on a board in the office would you be made to go and stand in the corner or the corridor would the director come and loudly remove you from the office would you be shouted at in front of all your colleagues would you get the opportunity to explain your actions or quietly apologise? Someone else leaves dirty dishes in the sink. They don't own up, so the whole office has to miss their coffee break. And at the end of a tiring day, you, spend a long t you, you long to spend time relaxing with your family or friends. Instead, you have to read a document that's no interest to you and write a report on it for the next day. So some people really got that very quickly and understood that what we're talking about is culture. We're not talking because because there are examples of wonderful teachers, head teachers in schools, wonderful practice, but our culture of schools, the environment in which children are learning and growing, is not is 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 not one that puts their human rights to the, the respect of their human dignity at its heart. Adults have a choice about whether to do that or not, but they won't after either the 16th or the 18th of March when incorporation is coming. So what children say about children's rights is it's good to feel we're making a difference. Sometimes things can be quite tough, but when adults listen to us and then make changes that make things better, it means we have better relationships with them because we can talk to them. It's important because children are people too. And adults just think children's rights means children get to do what they want, but that's not what it is. For a start, children don't want to be able to do what we want all the time. It just means that adults have to be kind to us and not shout or do bad things to us just because we're children. They have to help us be the best we can be. And essentially what the UN Convention is, is a framework, a scaffolding against, every, which, against which every one of us can measure how we're doing and below which we mustn't fall. And we know that the children's sense of well-being and their sense of belonging affects their ability to achieve. And this, is, this conversation is now happening in really high places in the world. OECD, if you feel good, you learn better. Jack Ma, World Economic Forum. Unless educators focus on teaching the skills that are uniquely human, independent thinking, teamwork, caring for others, kids don't stand a chance. If we don't change the way we teach our children, in 30 years we'll be in big trouble. And importantly, Andrea Schleicher, who's the head of education at the OECD, everybody gets very excited about their well-being surveys and others. We need to be focusing on collaborative problem solving and global competences, habits of creativity, such as being inquisitive and persistent, encouraging thinking and behaviours that encourage open mindedness and the desire to make the world a better place. And as we all know, the place that that starts is in our very earliest years. So embedding children's human rights encourages and enables, supports pre what they've just said, because it encourages curiosity over compliance, questioning alongside respect, 
challenging critical thinking over dutiful acceptance. And critically, it supports systemic change that's consistent and sustainable. So a child might go to 10 primary schools and have 10 different experiences. One might be really creative, one might be quite might, much more formal, one might be quite laid back, one might do outdoor, that's all fine, absolutely fine, because we've all got our individual interests and characteristics. But what at the heart of it, what won't change is their understanding and their ability to rely on the fact that they're they will be treated with respect. Florence Nightingale put it this way. She said, there are many more hands ready to pick us up when we fall than there are to prevent us falling in the first place. Well, we are those hands, we are them. So imagine a child coming to any of our establishments in a place where all the adults have got the UNCRC golden thread in their hearts and in their minds. When a child comes in there, the child, the parents, the community understands that what happens in there respects children's human rights to be treated with dignity. And as a matter of course, we are then dealing with nurture and play and trauma and well-being because that's because the preventative agenda of human rights means that we understand that when children come into school, they're presenting their life experiences to us. So what can you do? You can become an unfeerty. Many of you are already unfeerties. It's good to see unfeerties on the call. If you want to become an unfeerty, you don't have to be an expert in children's rights. You just have to have a willingness to think about this a bit more. Read the UNCRC. There's a child friendly version on our website. It's fantastic. You will want to be doing this once you've read it. You'll get a badge. Very, very easy to sign up to. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Gosh, this is good. I'm very glad I came. Um, right, folks. Well, I hope Kate's, I don't know how Kate's been following. There's been so many chat things going through, but I hope Kate's got some questions to start us off. Um, are you there, Kate? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have any questions on the chat box. Everybody's just very enthusiastic and um, about the conversations. But I do have some from um, Give Them Time. The Give Them Time campaign sent us a whole screed of questions. So I paraphrased them slightly. So um, the Give Them Time campaign wonders why the voice of a four-year-old seems to be less important than somebody further up the school in regards to what they want to do in, in regards to deferral processes. And does anybody want to tackle that? Why the voice of a four-year-old isn't as important? I think we've got lots of people here who value the voice of a four-year-old. I know that um, nurseries and early year classes um, often um, have uh, recordings and um, floor books and lots of stuff that their four-year-olds participate in. So um, why isn't that um, reaching out into... Um, people who just make the decisions about whether four-year-olds should be moving into school. Uh, Kathy, I mean, I would just say generally we have this this fight on our hands all the time. People talk about young people when they mean young people, and they talk about young people when they mean children and young people. I think children and young people are marginalised. Children are marginalised even further, and the youngest <laughs> children are mar marginalised even further than that. So I think in our in our sector, the four-year-old's voice is not less important, clearly, but in terms of our society and our culture and the place of children in society, there is an understanding that children of four, there's not an understanding, there's a feeling that children of four don't have the capacity to be able to articulate how they feel, how they experience things and what they need. And of course, they can. Of course they can. And one of the ways they do it, of course, is through play. Um, and I th that's one of the things that bothers me the most is, as Suzanne says, it's seen as frivolous. It is not remotely frivolous. It is, um, it's just what comes from children as they learn. That's the way they do it. <laughs> If I come in behind that, um, this is why I think getting really curious about things that frustrate us matters and is helpful. Mm -hmm. So we have a society where many people still think play is frivolous. And so how do you get 
although that can be frustrating for many people, how do you get from frustrated to curious about what is still going on and where does that come from? Because the people in the systems who are saying to the parents of the four-year-olds, it'll be fine if they move on, they don't need deferred, didn't show up at work that morning thinking, how will I make the lives of this family miserable? How will I have a negative impact on this child's development? It's really hard when you're just doing things in a way that's normal, you're just doing them what's useful. It's hard for us to think that that could be harming children. So for all the science that we have and for all the very positive things that Kathy and I have talked about tonight, I still think there are lots of areas of our culture that it's hard for us to get our heads around how to do things that are smart for children. There's tons of evidence that says that children starting school in formal ways at four is not good for them. And especially for the boys, there's lots of evidence that tells us that boys self-regulatory systems are not as mature as girls. But somehow that is hard to shift into the system I think part of it is that we don't think that we harm children when we do normal things. I think we sometimes don't understand development. So we tell ourselves the old fashioned things like they're, that they will catch up. I think if we think that we're doing good things, our intention is good enough. So for all that I have tried to say really positive things tonight, because I believe that there is, I believe we're in a time of opportunity but I also believe that it is hard for us to get our heads around some of these things. And if we really understood it, then give them time wouldn't need to exist just like upstart wouldn't need to exist. We would already be doing these things. So the more curious we can get about why is it hard to, why is it hard to make the shifts that the evidence tells us is that, gives us a different starting place than just being frustrated. Um, absolutely. And I think one of the big problems, of course, is we are stuck in a culture where we do, don't think of children as people. And the littler the children, the younger, the, the less we think of them as people, almost as though they're a different species. Um, and I've, I've argued this out with Together and people as well, that, that basically that under the age of about eight, it is quite difficult for children to advocate for themselves to the grown-ups because you know that's not the way things are seen as happening. So they need advocates. And the obvious advocates are the people who do actually understand child development. And we have an expanding workforce in Scotland now that really understands child development because we've got this growing early years workforce. So I don't want to put any responsibility on people. I don't want you to feel as though you're burdened with it. But you're the experts and you can help to spread this word. And I think the sorts of messages that have been coming out this evening are be curious, be respectful, as obviously. Um, Recognise it's the year of childhood and get conversations going wherever you can. That lots of people are talking about the language of deferrals as well on the chat box and how negative it is and how some people have been saying that they call it a bonus year and that many parents don't think about well-being as a reason to defer. So there's still lots of work there to be done in amongst play. Mm. Yeah. There is one thing that I always think about on these occasions when I'm getting a bit glum. <laughs> And that is back in the 1980s when I was a young teacher, it was normal to belt children on a daily basis. It was EIS policy. It was accepted by practically everyone that, you know, kids got belted. You know, when they got the spelling test wrong, or if they giggled in the line or something. And one lady, one woman, took this to the European Court of Human Rights. And the law, because we were part of the EU at the time, <laughs> the law was changed. Overnight, suddenly it became illegal to belt children. And it was like 
the whole world just suddenly thought, oh, well, that's the law then now. And everything changed. The whole attitude to it changed. And you see it happen such a lot when a law changes. I mean, when I was a young thing, we never put seatbelts on in the car. Um, and as a smoker, I couldn't believe that they were going to make me go outside the pub to have a cigarette. But the law changes and suddenly, oh, that's normalized now, which is why I think the UNCRC is such a, an amazing thing to be coming in because um, Kathy mentioned those three particular articles, but there's also a general comment and it has been agreed that general comments will be taken into account legally now. I think that was in, the, it's one of the latest things to the bill. General comment seven, Google it. <laughs> it's about early development and early childhood care and education. Um, so can and I, I think, yeah, please. Can I just come in there. So what part of the story that you're telling us reminds us, and Carol Craig tells that in her book, which I put in my PowerPoint slides, um, change doesn't come simply because it comes naturally. It comes because some people decided to lead it, right? So this UNCRC is here because some people decided to lead it and fight for it and they got brave and they put determination into it. Later, it seems obvious. So now it seems obvious to us that it's not a good idea to belt children. Right now, it will seem anathema to many people that there was a company in Loch Gelly that fashioned implements specifically designed to cause pain to children and they stamped them with their, with their logo basically. And that those were issued to new teachers without any training about how to use them. So now if you say that to new teachers, you can see their faces kind of drain and they feel sick to their stomach. But once upon a time, tons of people never questioned that. And so I'm, if I just, I've tried to wind that up to help us to think about what culture change looks like. And so then people on the other side of that law had to figure out how do you relate to children if you don't, if you don't belt them. So thinking about what culture change feels like often in the past helps when you're in it in the present, because in the present, it's harder to see what can be harmful. And I find comfort from knowing that we got change, which I benefit from now, or children benefit from now, or people benefit from now, because in the past, somebody got brave enough to fight for it. And that sometimes they were scared. So the two women that argued to stop belting children, they weren't popular in their neighborhood. They weren't popular with the teachers. They weren't popular with the head teachers. They were really brave. So for those of you who are in the middle of all of this, sometimes it just takes courage and insistence. And if you, if you know that, then I think it's easier to step into the hard times because that is just part of the process of culture change. And one day in the not maybe too far future, everybody will think that of course children have rights, but we wouldn't have them now if people like Kathy and lots of other people hadn't been fighting to make this happen. I hope something in that is helpful because otherwise it gets frustrating in the midst of it. Culture change happens because people get determined to make it happen. And, and Kathy was going to add something, I think. Yes, I was just going to say that, that um, thanks for that, Suzanne. And I, that was really powerfully put. And I think we are all those two women now who went to the European court. We are all of them. And I just very quickly want to tell an anecdote of a, of a friend of mine who's doing primary school teaching and was out on her placement. And she was using a children's parliament activity, which she'd used lots of times, which involved children sitting on the floor, looking at doing a barometer, a well-being barometer. What makes them feel good? A dignity barometer what makes them feel good and what makes them feel not so good and it was chaos she couldn't believe it it didn't work first time ever it didn't work in this classroom and of course it had to be the session that her placement supervisor was was observing so she eventually after about 20 minutes she gave up and she had all the children back at the desk and she gave them a, a task to do and what was really interesting in terms of culture and how we change things and how we have to be brave is that her, the feedback from her tutor was 
nothing about the environment of a classroom and why were children who were eight and nine years old unable to sit on the floor in, in a circle and do a self-directed task without poking each other and just playing up and behaving, being really naughty? Why did that all collapse? The question and, the, and the, she was encouraged to think about was, why was she not mo more authoritarian in that situation? If we want to change culture, you know, everybody on this call were probably thinking, oh my God, of course there have to be boundaries, of course there has to be structure. But my goodness, if we want children to be growing up, to be able to take part in these conversations, to for us not to be having to have this conversation in 20 years time, we need to be supporting our trainee teachers to be able to have these conversations and to challenge situations where just a few weeks ago that conversation took place you know that's clearly not a healthy environment these children are not being their self self agency their confidence is not being encouraged because they're every day being told where to go where to sit what to talk about when to talk what to you know I just, want, I just think that that was a powerful example and I hope we all think of ourselves as those two people because that's we have to step into that space now and become unfearties and it's not easy but we do, and we do need courage. So then, Can I just come in there on the, on the question of language because the word authority is quite an important one. Grown-ups are in many ways authorities on things that kids can't be because we have experience of the world and we know about what can happen if you go over there where you shouldn't be going over because it's dangerous um and the the, the adjective that comes from authority yet yeah, there is one authoritarian but there is another one which is authoritative and when i did the research on parenting for the uh, for my book toxic childhood i was fascinated that, that they divided the people who looked at the at parenting that was successful. They talked about it being warm, but firm, and that you were the grown up, but you were taking the child's you know, point of view into account and talking and being authoritative. Um, if you were too far on the firm side and not warm enough, that was called authoritarian. If you were too far on the warm side, and not firm enough, that was called indulgent. And it's as though we don't know about authoritative. We sort of think it's either indulgent or it's authoritarian. But actually, it's finding that way to feel, yeah, I'm the grown up, I've got to be the grown up here, but I, I respect them as people just as much as I respect me. And moving from into that zone, which is what actually, in my experience, successful teaching was always about. I wish I'd known about that research before because it's I, I, that word authoritarian is awful, but authoritative is balanced. So if we knew more about boundaries, that would help. But we don't talk much about boundaries, and so lots of people aren't able to think about them explicitly. Boundaries are what let you manage all that all that messiness. And very often we then end up resorting in our society to power. And I just wanted to check that out there because that's not a word that has come up much tonight. Um, and so we end up, um, because very often, you know, most of the adults in our culture experience power dynamics between the adults and the children. So they just repeat those, right? I want to say all, and then you think, okay, it's not maybe quite all. There will be some families out there where power dynamics were not the way that they were structured. But for the most of them, that's the way our culture structures relations to children is power dynamics. The UNCRC is trying to get us to rethink some of those power dynamics. That's hard. Lots of people don't want to give up power. But, but your, your, your work has made a real impact on getting relationship focused practice. Sue, so I'm just... I'm, I'm delighted if it has. Part of what I'm trying to do tonight is to help us to walk both sides of that, is to help us to think, why is this stuff still so hard? And to stay positive. Because I think if you put both of those together, that, you know, it's kind of like the two sides of the coin, but you need both of those. We, 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 do, we should live in a world where we don't need absur. We should not need give them time if we really understood this stuff. And that, and yet we need both of those campaigns. 
And at the same time, there's all that great stuff happening that Kathy and I talked about. So I think that is really intriguing. How is it possible that both of those situations exist at the same time? And if we get really curious about these tough things, we come up with some new answers. Like, let me say one more thing. Um, if you said to teachers at the moment that the traffic light system that, that is just normal in classrooms or you know the golden time is based in shame, because it is, that will make a whole lot of people freeze with fear. How will you manage a group of 30 children if you don't have the traffic light system? And nobody intended to use shame and nobody said that before. So it's a weird, uncomfortable idea that a standard classroom management technique that lots of people use is based in shame, but it is, it shames children. And then that changes their biology. How do you help the teachers who are just doing what's normal and who are doing good things for children to step into something that is that uncomfortable? Well, that's the same question that we asked, you know, several d decades ago. How do you help teachers to step into the idea that smacking children was painful and, and harmful? So that's a bit from the past and a bit from now. The now feels scary. Curious conversations will help. Happy. Yeah, and I think that I think that the incorporation agenda will allow us to have this conversation, will legitimise having the conversation, because we're going to have to understand what it means to respect ch a child's human dignity. So Police Scotland's um, approach to managing the, the pandemic is to engage, explain, encourage, and the last one is enforce. We don't want thousands of people to be charging through the courts because children's rights are being breached. We want to use this opportunity to have conversations to think about what do we need to put in place to make sure children thrive and flourish in the first place so that we don't have to go down a, a, a justice route. So the, the conversation, I mean, I've heard terrible conversations in school, uh, in, in um, staff rooms, the way some children are spoken about, the, expect, the low expectations that some teachers have of, of some children. This, this, the, the incorporation of UNCRC, I think, opens up new opportunities in new places with different people to talk about what does it mean to, um, to, what does, what does it mean to bring children's human, human rights alive in order that we're not just complying with the legislation, but we're using the transformational power of using this rod of steel against which we measure and, and, and which we, we mustn't fall. We can use, we're using the same language. You know, for the first time, we will have a set of 42 statements that we can't deviate from. We have to discuss them. We have to work out what they mean. And some of them will mean different things for different people. But there's a, there's a, these are minimum standards. We can't go below them. So a conversation about, you know, I've had a teacher say to me, I have a right to use my voice. Well, we now have a legitimate way. To, I have now I can legitimately say, well, what do you mean by that? You know, because actually you're not allowed to scream at the kids any longer. That's not acceptable because you're undermining their human dignity. So let's use this opportunity to have a conversation about what ca what can we do to support, encourage, enable, guide, bring people into the conversation so folk feel supported, encouraged, inspired to think about doing things differently. Because I know through my own work that when teachers get this, they love the fact that they can share power with children because they see it's much better for children and it's much better for them. And then they'll say, but how did I get my teacher to do it? Because she, she just doesn't get this. So this is an opportunity for us to have a, a holistic a framework. It applies to every teacher, police officer, social worker, parent in the country. And I think if we can just all get on that same bandwagon, we can start to have these conversations much more frequently and honestly and courageously. I can't imagine a better conversation with which to have started the Players the Way group. It's been absolutely terrific. It does seem actually, Kathy, that the answer seems to be t-shirts from, <laughs> from yes. everything that's going on in the chat box. Um, but I think the other the other thing that's really did make an impact, and I watched the chat coming up, was that slide you put up uh, about how would you feel if you went to work every day and and I remember that when I first saw that, it made a huge impact on me because it really, really indicates how we treat children as another species, as though they are, well, like we used to have slaves, you know, and things like that. Um, I'm afraid it's, um, 
Can I yeah. just say before we finish that there are lots of questions in the chat box, but the questions could come into the next slots of the book club because there's people in there who will be able to answer these questions. So, you know, I'm saving them up. So I hope you'll all join us. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Well, that, that's um, that's it. I've got to finish on two things. I've got it written down. Um, one is we won't be having the next one uh, next book next week because we have another thing. We have a, a thing called Imagine If, which is um, part of a celebration of the life of um, Ken Robinson. And um, what we're going to imagine is if Ken Robinson could meet realizing the ambition, how would he feel, and how might his ideas be exemplified by realizing the ambition. Um, so that, that's gonna be advertised and it's on Eventbrite already. And the following week, we'll be having hopefully the book group again. And again, the adverts for that. I think we'll try and put the Eventbrite for that out tomorrow. Um, oh, thank you everybody. Um, I can't tell you how much I want to thank Kathy and Suzanne and, and Brett, wherever you are, somewhere in the background. Um, I did, I've got another note here as well, though, and that's the last thing. We, we don't charge for our meetings on, on, um, on Zoom, um, but uh, if we were having a meeting in a, in a village hall or a school or somewhere, we usually send a bucket round at the end for people to put donations in. Kate is usually in charge of the bucket. Um, well, we can't do that. But if anybody does think that they'd like to help keep this sort of thing going, if you go on the Upstart website, scroll down the front page, there is a place where you can do a donation and um, any donations, no matter how small, are incredibly welcome so that we can carry on doing what these two ladies have been suggesting, getting the conversations going and my goodness, informing. Thank you both so much so much and that will take us all onwards and upwards which i think is the best way of finishing off the evening thank you very much everybody for coming and um thank you and good night everyone <laughs>